Okay. All right, this is an interview with Richard Faulkner, the Micro Tell Inn in Auburn, New York. It is the 24th of September, 2003, approximately 9.30 a.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, Richard John Faulkner, uh, October 8, 1924, in West Eaton, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I graduated from high school, but didn't go any further. Okay. Do you remember where you were and uh, your reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was watching the Chicago Bears football game uh, when it came broke in with the news. Okay, do you remember your reaction to this? I was surprised because I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? Um, I enlisted two days after I uh, turned 18 in, uh, in uh, October 1942. But they didn't take me until December 11th, 1942. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you select the Air Force or the Air Corps? Yes, I did. Why did you do that? Because I wanted to fly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Had you ever flown prior to this? Uh, just once. Uh, I took a trip when I was a senior in high school. But uh, I wanted to get into the pilot program, but uh, I didn't uh, pass it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, where did you go for your training? I uh, went to uh, Fort Niagara uh, in December 11th, 1942. Stayed there a week, went to Miami Beach, spent two weeks in Miami Beach, went to Goldsboro, North Carolina, to Airplane and Engine School. I spent uh, two months there. I went to uh, from there, I went to gunnery school in Fort Myers, Florida for two months. Then I was uh, went to uh, Amarillo, Texas, and I was assigned to the 100th Bomb Group. Or uh, I went to take that back. I was assigned to the group training in Dalhart, Texas. We uh, got ready to go overseas, and uh, my pilot didn't pass the proficiency test, so we went to Pyote, Texas for another month. Then we uh, uh, got ready and went to uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, picked up our airplane, a B-17G. We flew to Grenier Field, New Hampshire. From Grenier Field, New Hampshire to uh, Goose Bay, Labrador, to Iceland, to Stornoway, Scotland. From there, we uh, processed and uh, we went to gunnery training, further training uh, at the WASH in England, and then we went to uh, the 100th Bomb Group. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you stay with the same crew? We were in the same crew uh, from uh, all the way through training and uh, flying over uh, to England and, and assigned to the 100th Bomb Group. Okay, um, did you stay with the same plane? No. They uh, stored away Scotland, they took the plane for modification. So when we got to the 100th bomb group, you flew whatever plane was available. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get a chance to name a plane? Well, we were going to name it a square lady, but uh, we didn't last that long. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you uh, ever decorate your jackets? Uh, I put the name on it. Mm -hmm. But I, I was shot down in my first mission, so I didn't. Okay. Where was your first mission? We were uh, going to go to uh, Augsburg, Germany, and then to Munich. A part of the group was going to Munich. We were assigned Munich. And um, we, uh, uh, we flew to Berlin Playboy, it was the name of the plane that was assigned to us that day. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the mission and what happened? Yes, we, uh, we were delayed an hour for takeoff because of the fog. 
we got uh, airborne, and soon after crossing the channel, uh, a plane above us got hit, and he come down and hit us, broke us in two pieces. And I was in the ball turret, and I had a chute in there, and I bailed out. Oh, you had a chute in the turret with you? Yes, I did. Uh, I'm being small, you could get one in there. Mm -hmm. uh, How did you get out of the turret itself? Well, the, the plane, uh, I was with the tail, and it went, turned upside down, and I was on top then. And uh, I got the door handles open, and the door opened, luckily. It can only open in a stowed position uh, and uh, from the outside, and it just happened to be that way. Just lucky if it was in the position where I could open the door. Mm -hmm. I had to shoot uh, hooked on one hook on uh, uh, my uh, uh, harness. So when I got out of the turret, I hooked the rest, rest of it on the way down. Then I pulled the ripcord, I pulled the free fall, and I could make out objects on the ground. I pulled the ripcord, and uh, then I landed in a heap by a woods on a hillside in a pasture. Did others from your uh, plane survive? No, they didn't. Uh, the other nine people were all killed, and I was the only survivor. Could you describe what happened to you once you hit the ground? Yes, I <clears throat> gathered up my chute and uh, carried it over into the woods and uh, found a bunch of leaves and berry bushes and I hid everything uh, in there, uh, the goggles and the helmet and the parachute and the harness and the whole works. And then I uh, saw that there was a farm nearby so I uh, started for there but the Germans, I could see them coming so I got back and buried myself in the leaves in the berry brambles, and uh, when they went through, they didn't want to look in the berry bushes, so I, I didn't get uh, found out about. And then that that uh, it was about noon, and then uh, that evening uh, when it started to get dark, a farm the farmer came and uh, and I told him that it was an American. I couldn't speak French. He couldn't speak English. So he told me to wait uh, my motion in me till the sun went down. So I waited to hid in the woods until uh, dark and then he came and got me. My knees were banged up and my ankles. And uh, so they took me in and uh, put me in the barn to begin with. And uh, when uh, they figured the Germans weren't looking for me, they. Uh, they took me in the house and put me in the bed and then, uh, I got some uh, hot towels to soak my knees and ankles and to get the swelling down. But they they kept motioning to me that there was uh, something wrong so I, somebody got the idea they had a mirror and then I, I see it was all dried blood, <laughs> all my face was covered with dried blood I, I cut myself somehow coming out. and. Uh, so that got cleaned up and uh, the next day they moved me to another place. But the, the people got nervous. They thought the Germans knew I was there. So they hustled me out after dark to another place. I heard later that uh, they uh, executed that family because they were pretty sure I was there, but they couldn't find me. Because they knew that uh, there were ten people in the bomber and there were only nine bodies. Mm -hmm. So I was went to another place and I stayed there for about a week. Then they shipped, shipped me to another place. It took me about for another uh, seven days or something. And then I uh, was uh, transported on the back of a motorcycle and um, to another location and we had a flat tire and uh, it was right under a German machine gun post and it, they they were up there laughing at us for having a flat tire and I thought 
If you only knew, fella, that <laughs> this is an American down here. Now, were you in uh, French? You took your uniform off? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, they, uh, uh, they had me in civilian clothes. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I went to Paris. And because I lost all my identification and my escape kit when I went out and ripped the pant leg off where I had it. So they were going to take make up a uh, get a new picture and make up a false ID. And uh, they made it up and there was a said I had a 15 year old deaf mute. <laughs> the Germans were kind of slow because they all kinds of germ, uh, deaf mutes running around and. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we always laughed about it. But Do you still have those papers? No, I, uh, they took everything away from me uh, uh, when I got back. And, um, because, and they sent me the magazine I held up in front of my face on the train. You, you, when I was on the train going from Paris to Morlaix, where I eventually exited France, they uh, I had a magazine and you hold that up to like you're reading or dozing and mm -hmm. most people don't bother you. So I, we were, uh, got the pictures taken and he took me around sightseeing and you know, Champ de Lise and all that and I, <laughs> I was so scared. I, <laughs> I thought all the Germans, all of them were walking around there. I thought they were all watching me. And, uh, but uh, probably was the best thing to get her out in the open. but mm -hmm. So when we got ready to leave, we were going to go on the subway and there was two other fellows in the apartment with me. One was from uh, Big Redhead and one was a uh, southerner from Houston, Texas. What you do is you, the fellow in the underground goes down the stairs and when he gets to the bottom, then you start down and so on. And, in single file. When he got to the corner uh, of the street, then I came out of the building, and then I got to the corner, and then he was at another corner, and I didn't see any of the other fellows coming. And uh, so I threw my hands up, like, what, what do I do now? And he motioned me to come on. Well, after the uh, VE day, the Germans surrendered. I run into those two fellows. They were Gestapo picked them up as they come out the door, and they were held prisoner till the end of the war. Now were they flyers also? Yeah, they were gunners. Both of mm -hmm. them were gunners, and, and uh, but uh, they were. They said, "Faulkner, you so and so, you got out, and we got caught." Mm -hmm. But I was short and dark, like a Frenchman, and, and so when I got on the subway, he, the fellow in the underground got in one door and I got in the other door. When he gets off, I get off. And, but I was standing right next to a colonel or some big monkey monk in the SS because he had a uh, satchel uh, handcuffed to his arm with a uh, guard with a Sten gun. And we started up and I bumped. They, he bumped into me and and the SS guy, the fellow said something to him and he turned around to me and he said, pardon him, moi. I thought, oh my God. I thought I was done right then and there. But uh, then I got to Morlaix and I got to a deserted French farmhouse and uh, there was people from the underground in there and also a pilot from a P-47 that was shot down. His name was Ken Williams, and uh, he had flown 63 missions, and he, I asked him how come he got shot down, and he said, I shot myself down. He said, I was strafing a, a German bomber, and it blew up under me and blew the, both wings off my P-47. He said, I crashed, and I started running across the field, and, I'm trying to hide, and I look down, and I got the bright May West still. <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, uh, the pretty soon in come two ladies and another man, uh, two men. One was a captain in the British intelligence, 
and uh, two ladies had just been uh, broken out of the jail. They were underground workers, a mother and daughter. The other fellow was uh, losing his mind, and so they tried to get him out of there before he got caught. So we waited, and pretty soon they they distributed some handguns to two guys, and they they went out, and I found out later they were to go out and watch the machine gun nest. And if they saw us, to shoot the Germans. But if not, leave them alone because they would use the route over again. And they told us to watch the phosphorus dots in the track and the found. Don't get out of it because it's a minefield. So we went across the minefield and went down the bank, down to the shore. We waited down there, and um, pretty soon, after about, this was about, Four o'clock in the morning, they uh, uh, flashed a uh, flashlight or light from the ship from the shore to out to sea, and uh, the Germans uh, or the British uh, rode in with two rubber dinghies to pick us up, and we uh, were uh, uh, Ken Williams and the pilot and I were put on a one. Uh, like a PT boat, it was a uh, British gunboat, and uh, the other were put on the other one, and we started. We were put down in the hold, uh, the crew's quarters. We started up, and we could hear gunfire, and pretty soon we could hear shells hitting the boat. And uh, pretty soon the captain opened the hatch up, and he said, uh, uh, "One of you guys a gunner." I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I just had a gunner uh, get killed, and I need a gunner. So I went up on top, and uh, they gave me one of those uh, 303 uh, machine guns. We pulled the guy's body away so we could, and then we kept on in the gunfight for a little while, and then pretty soon two British Spitfires showed up and chased off the, the German e-boats. And uh, Ken Williams, uh, the pilot, he said, I was always mad at you, because I saw him about 40-some years later. He said, I was always mad at you, because I wasn't fast enough to tell him I, I was a gunner, so I could get up there, and I, all I could do was sit here and hear this stuff going on. So I, I <laughs> we had quite a time about that. And then uh, my, uh, we, while we got uh, into England, and then they uh, had us put on British uniforms, and then they took we took us into London. And then they issued us uh, uh, American uniforms, but they were trying to hide the fact from the Germans. But I don't think it worked. Now, how long did it take from the time you were shot down to the time you were arrested? I was uh, I was uh, 29 days. Mm -hmm. I was shot down the 18th day of March, 1944, and I was uh, picked up April 16th. 1944. Were your parents ever notified and, and yes. how were they notified? I still have the telegram that uh, my mother received. Uh, would regret to inform you that your son Richard J. Faulkner is missing on a mission over Germany. And uh, no, no other details. Mm -hmm. and then when I got back they had a form with a telegram to send my mother, and what it said was, "Am feeling fine, having a swell holiday." <laughs> so she got the message anyway. But that's how she found out. That must have been devastating for her when she got the first oh, telegram. Yes, she wrote to the uh, adjutant general and all everybody she could write to. My. Uh, uh, Chaplain on the base wrote us in condolences, and uh, I sent that uh, a few years ago. I sent that thing to uh, that uh, communication to him, so he could have it and put it in his genealogy files. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, after you returned, um, did you go back on duty, or I went to um, I, I had a, a 28 day they call it survivor leave. <clears throat> And then I went to um, 
Atlantic City, New Jersey. They processed me there. Then they sent me to the hospital in Nashville for rehabilitate. My knees were pretty weak and the ankles. And so I was there for a month. And then I went to uh, Amarillo again. And then I was assigned to Denver. I, I went into a mobile training unit for airplane and engines. They sent me to uh, B-29 school in January of 44, uh, 45. And uh, we uh, went through the school for the B-29s and then we went back to Denver and they were going to send us to the Pacific. And uh, we were all, there were nine of us were combat returnees. So we said we didn't want to go back. There's a lot of other people that had never been over there. Mm -hmm. So they didn't make an issue of it and they put us in the training units. And I stayed in the training unit till uh, I got discharged in October 27th, uh, 1945. Now when did you run into the fellows that uh, were captured? Uh... I ran into them when after I left the, the hospital in Nashville. Uh -huh. When I went to, uh, to Amarillo, and I was in the PX, <laughs> they hollered at me. Uh, my wife always said, don't rob a bank because everybody remembers you. <laughs> I, I, when I saw those fellows, then I recognized them. But, uh, uh -huh. And they were kidding me about, and then they told them about when they were captured, they, they kept moving them as the Americans kept getting closer. And they had them march on the outside of the formations of the Germans. So if anybody was going to get shot, they, mm -hmm. they were it. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were getting low on food and and everything, but they made out, they, they got through it. Now did you, uh, after you were discharged, um, did you ever uh, make use of the GI Bill? Uh, I went to a, a I trained uh, for auto mechanics mm -hmm. to school, but that was. Uh, Did you ever use the 5220 club at all? Never. 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 Mm -hmm. I never uh, been out of work till I retired. Mm -hmm. I went from being a mechanic to, to work for New York State Electric and Gas as a lineman, and I spent 35 years with them. Now the P-47 pilot, Ken Williams, when did you run into him again? Uh, he, he moved to Rochester, New York, and uh, uh, after he retired, he stayed in until uh, he retired from his uh, lieutenant colonel. And he, uh, uh, I found his name on the list of the Escape Evade magazine that I, the uh, association I joined. And, uh, I called him up and I went up and saw him in Rochester. I, my wife, she said, look at the two of you, you're two midgets, she says you're supposed to look like John Wayne. <laughs> now is he still living? Uh, I, I don't know, I sent a, a letter to him uh, a year ago and I got no answer. So mm -hmm. I have no idea what, what happened to him, whether he moved away or his wife who was a teacher, I got an idea maybe they moved when she retired. Mm -hmm. But my wife and I took a trip to uh, France uh, two years ago and um, uh, we got to Normandy uh, in, uh, in the cemetery and uh, I asked the curator if he could run off my bomb group and he said no, it would take too long because I only had about 15 minutes. He says, but I can run your squadron off. So he ran the squadron off, and three of the fellows who were in the plane with me are, are buried there. The other six, they sent their bodies back in that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were, they're still there. Now, when, uh, when you were uh, shot down and, and you were parachuting, away from the plane, did you see the plane crash or anything? No, I didn't. I I was too busy uh, trying to uh, get the harness, uh, get my chute hooked back on it. Mm -hmm. Then when I pulled the D-ring, nothing happened. So there's three little snaps on the covers the pilot chute. So I got those unsnapped and fished the, the pilot chute out and luckily it 
pulled out and pulled the rest of the shoe out. Hmm. Well, you were lucky. Every it was luck all the way. Hmm. Yes, everything. You can't understand. You always have a guilty feeling that why me? Why did I get out and nobody else? Mm -hmm. And why should I be still around and then not? But I've talked to other people and they had the same thing. Now when I got back to my group from uh, coming back across the channel, uh, General LeMay, who turned out to be uh, afterwards uh, head of the Air Force mm -hmm. and the chairman of Joint Chiefs, he uh, called uh, two, two other fellows and myself up there that had just returned and he wanted to know what he could do to change anything or what needed to be done. And I said, well, you have an order out, somebody has an order out to uh, put two new pair of shoes on time on your harness so you have a good pair of shoes going out. And I said, that would never work because the Germans would see those new shoes right off the bat. And so he says, I'll rescind that, sir. So he said, I'll put good uh, old pair of shoes. So now, um, you mentioned here in the form you filled out that you supplied information about German troops. What kind of information did you supply? Well, I, I told them about, the, they told me to, that in Metz there was a, a German reinforced uh, a tank battalion, they were there to go wherever they needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also uh, what the configuration was of the minefields that we went through, where all the, the uh, machine gun posts that we saw along the road, all the uh, railroad stations had, and uh, anything of importance they had, uh, uh, troops with guns and their, so I just told them that how many of I thought was in the vicinity in each town that I was in. Mm -hmm. But I never tried to learn the names of the people that were helping me, because if I got captured, I didn't want to have any information I could give them. If I didn't know anything, I couldn't tell them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you, when you went back, did you ever try to retrace no, some of your route because we didn't we didn't get far enough north. We was up uh, just after Dieppe, up near the Belgian border, and uh, our trip, our tour, took us uh, just to uh, Normandy and Paris, and uh, never got that far north. Mm -hmm. I don't know as I'd remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Now um, this Escape Evaders Association. Um, do you ever go to meetings or? No, I haven't gone. That now. I belong to the 100 Bomb Group Association for years and I've never gone to one of those. Either. How about the 8th Air Force Association? Do they no, do you belong to that? Or? Uh, <coughs> no, I don't. Really. But uh, the only reason I don't go to the meetings is because uh, the reunions is because there's hardly anybody there that I knew. <laughs> I mean, they were. This was early before the invasion, and uh, your chances were about one in five of making it. And uh, you had to fly 25 missions at that time. And there was nine crews went in to the 100 bomb group in March of 44, and uh, one crew finished. The rest were either shot down or killed, taken prisoner or killed. But that one one crew never got wounded or. Nobody ever got wounded or anything. Hmm. So you wonder how you... <laughs> so you were only there for a very short time before I was you only, were shot down. I was, I was there nine days mm -hmm. and went on my first mission. We flew diversion raids, uh, you know, uh, getting acquainted with the territory. Mm -hmm. We flew uh, a few of them, three or four of them. And, but uh, I was only there nine days. I was in France longer than I was there. Hmm. Then, of course, when I got back to the base, I was there for, uh, well, I got from the 16th until uh, uh, May, so t about two weeks I was there. Now, did you ever join any, uh, like the American Legion or VFW? I, or? I belonged to the American Legion and, uh, and I belonged to a 100 bomb group and escape E of AD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, 
Obviously it did. How do you think your time in the service changed or affected your life? Well, you appreciate being alive an mm -hmm. awful lot. No, I, I, I don't know. It, uh, it's just I, I always had an allotment for, um, for my mother. My father died when I was 12, and there was five children. And uh, we all had to pitch in and help. And when I went in the service, I immediately signed up for uh, uh, benefits for my mother to help her out financially. And that's the first thing I asked uh, General May. I, I said, uh, what about my lot? Was my mother getting her money while I was gone? He says, Sergeant, I have a mother that I have an allotment for too, but it was continued. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add, or? No, the, I just appreciate everything, <laughs> and uh, it just amazes you how lucky you can ever mm -hmm. be. I just have one question to ask. Uh, <clears throat> your flight crew, had you trained with them a long time? No, I've I trained with them from, uh, I, I joined the crew in uh, September of 43, mm -hmm. and we trained uh, together, we stayed together until I got shot down. Okay. I actually wasn't shot down, I guess. Yes. I, yeah. Yeah. It was another plane. So you're, you're playing basically the fuselage split yeah, so it, in it two broke, parts. It broke into two parts uh, right in behind the wing. The tail part flipped over. I was with the tail, and that left the tail gunner and two waist gunners myself. And the other part had the radio man and the bombardier, navigator, pilot, and co-pilot. Mm -hmm. But uh, they just couldn't get out of it all. And the other plane, there was only two people who got out of that one. I found out he was, of course, he was the same bomb group mm -hmm. and uh, different squadron. But he, uh, two people I found out through the escapee uh, thing. Uh, one of them was taken prisoner, the other came out through the underground. But the rest of their uh, people were killed. The other seven were killed there. So, uh, nine, sixteen people. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you.